during my second or third year in Riong with the John Fugang. The cold season came in. It was colder than usual for Thailand. Wind was coming down from the north, and I started feeling a little homesick, thinking about what happens in the winter, the snow, all the build up to Christmas. I happened to mention to John Fuang that I was getting a little homesick. He said, yes, every society has its stupid customs, doesn't it? And then he went on to talk about the Chinese custom of having to go to the family uh, <coughs> family's uh, cemetery spot every year in early April. And if you didn't go on that particular day, the, the family would get really all upset. And looking at a culture from outside, it really, really does seem strange that one particular day would be different from all the other days. That there's one day for giving presents, and the day before, the day after, is not supposed to be a day for giving presents. There's one day to be merry, and other days are off the calendar. It's all very arbitrary. And it's good to have that perspective of standing outside your culture and seeing how arbitrary a lot of the, the customs are. That's one of the things we do as we meditate. We try to stand outside of our culture, have some time apart where it's just you. And you can start questioning the thoughts that come up in the mind, because all of them are rega regarded as distractions right now. You're supposed to be here with the breath. And you'll find different voices coming up in the mind. Some of them are just random voices pulling you here, pulling you there. Others come with more of a stentorian tone, in other words, ordering you to do something or saying you have to do something. Sometimes it comes from your family, sometimes it comes from the culture around you, the media. And you have to learn how to say no to those voices as well. Then you find that it's free, that you don't have to at this moment give in to all the compulsions and all of the imperatives that society demands of you. Even the parts of society that you tend to believe, you don't have to give in to them either. It's good to step back from your beliefs. So well, what am I here for? Now if we just look at this one issue of why am I causing suffering, how can I put an end to that? Why am I causing stress? How I can put an end to that? How about just looking at this one issue? Because this is the issue that really eats away at the heart. Everything we do is for the sake of happiness, and we find a lot of things we do for happiness don't work. They actually come out the other way. And some of the things we do are the things that we've been told by our society to do, and other things are things we've simply picked up on our own. And either way, it's good to be able to step back from your old habits and examine them. That's what the practice is all about, is questioning your old habits, questioning the things you take for granted. So you can see how liberating it would be if you didn't take them for granted. This is the principle that John Munn was getting at when he talked about following the customs of the noble ones rather than the customs of the society, normal society, people accusing him of not following Thai or Laotian customs as he was trying to get back to the original practice. And he said he wasn't interested in the customs of the Thais or the Laos or anybody, aside from the customs of the noble ones. He followed their customs and theirs freedom. Now this doesn't mean that just Asian customs or the customs of people of defilement. American customs, Australian customs, European customs, beliefs. These are all the customs and beliefs of people with defilement. He 
You want to look purely at the issue. Why is there stress here? Where is the stress to begin with? And why is it there? What can be done about it? And everything else that comes up in the mind you take as a potential reason for why you're suffering. All the beliefs you have. And sometimes they're very firmly held beliefs. But it's good to be able to step back from them. What if that's not true? What if this isn't true? And at least for the time that you're sitting here, let yourself be liberated from your presuppositions. Of course, often it's hard to see what you're taking for granted because you are taking it for granted. This is one of the reasons why the breath is here. You know that if you're not staying with the breath, you're off target right now. And anything else that comes up that's not related to the breath is something that you want to put aside. And it may shock you sometimes to see how much you have to put aside in order to stay here. Because when defilements come, they're not obviously defilements all the time. Sometimes they come in more subtle forms. Sometimes they take up the voice of the Dharma. So you should be doing this. You should be doing that. When it's actually not what you should be doing. You should be staying with your breath right now. So you have to learn how to recognize all these voices as distractions, all these voices as things you've got to put aside if you really want any freedom. Because that's why we're here. We're looking for freedom, freedom from suffering, freedom from all the limitations we place on ourselves. Whether those limitations are dressed up as the bad side of the mind or the good side of the mind. You've got to watch out for them. You've got to learn how to question them. What attitudes do you have to put aside immediately? What attitudes do you have to hold on in the meantime because they're part of the path? And what attitudes do you have to abandon only at the very end of the path? We learn this only through practice. So if a thought comes up that says, stay with the breath right now, you follow that thought. Any thought that would come up would give you any reason for leaving the breath right now. It's not the time, this is not the place for that. Because the Dharma, to be Dharma, has to be not only true, but also beneficial and timely. The problem is we have the Dharma in books, and it's there all the time. You can look up the you can look up the five hindrances, you can look up the seven factors for awakening, you can look up any topic at any time. But the question is, what particular topic, what particular part of the training is appropriate for you right here, right now? And if it's a part of the Dharma that's not appropriate for you right now, then it's not really Dharma for you right now. We're in training here. And part of the training means Whatever task you have to learn right now, whatever skill you have to develop right now, that's what you've got to focus on. It's not just a matter of confirming what the Buddha said. Oh yes, there is. There are inconstant things, and there are stressful things, and there are not self things. The real issue is when is that particular insight useful for you? And it might be useful when you're trying to get past a particularly strongly held preconceived notion you have. See, well, this notion, too, is inconstant. It's an event in the mind. If it's stressful, and if it's inconstant and stressful, why should, should you hold on to it? There are other things though, that you have to hold on to right now, like the breath. You could say, well, the breath is inconstant, it's stressful, not self, let's just let go of that and get beyond all this issue of having to practice concentration. But that doesn't work. It short circuits the pattern. This inconstant thing is something you actually try to make more constant, i.e., through your continual mindfulness, your continual alertness, so the ardency with which you try to develop these qualities. That's something you hold on to. 
just as we're talking today. And dealing with human beings is difficult. It requires a lot of skill and a lot of restraint. Skill and restraint are stressful. Now, this doesn't mean that we should abandon skill and abandon restraint when we're dealing with people. That would create more problems. So it's a matter of having a sense of time and place, and knowing what to hold on to, knowing what to let, what to let go, at what time. Fortunately, as you're sitting here with your eyes closed, you don't have to worry about dealing with people. It's just you and the breath. You learn how to understand the breath. You learn how to gain a sense of where even your perceptions of the breath can place limitations on it. You learn how to loosen up some of those preconceived notions so that there's a greater sense of ease, a greater sense of well-being. sense of refreshment, rapture, fullness. These things can be induced if you have a skillful perception of the breath. So if you find that it's not happening, you might ask yourself, well, maybe my idea of the breath is not as skillful as it could be. And you hear about it, John Lee talking about the different ways that the breath energy can flow in the body. And you ask yourself, well, where do I feel that? What would it be like if I could feel the, say, the breath coming up the back, or the breath coming up the front, or the breath going down, the breath coming in and out through all the pores, the breath as the primary element I'm experiencing here? Where am I blocking the breath where I don't have to block it? This requires using your imagination a little bit. What are alternative ways of perceiving the breath? I remember when I was in Thailand, I was a little bit jealous of a lot of the Thai people who had grown up thinking about the breath energy in the body. It was a concept that they had learned how to use and learned how to relate to. And for me, it was very foreign. I felt I was operating with a handicap. But you find that regardless of what your background is, you can, you can learn how to use the, a new idea. Just allow yourself to think in those terms and ask yourself, well, where is my thinking getting in the way of that? And you'll be surprised sometimes at what's getting in the way. Again, something is usually something you've taken for granted. So that's a lot of the practice, is not taking things for granted questioning your assumptions, to see even where the things that you sincerely believe may be actually getting in the way. So do your best as you're sitting here meditating to, to free the mind from anything that's getting in the way of the path. And to figure out which aspect of the path is the one you've got to focus on right now. To have a sense of time and place in your practice. This is a training. Fortunately, it's a training in well-being. A training in liberation. So even though the idea of training may sound onerous, it's actually for our freedom. Regardless of our background, it's possible to liberate the mind from not only the bad parts of our background, but also the good parts. That's how radical this freedom is. <laughs>